Congregation of St. Joseph of Orange. She stationed out in Los Angeles at Loyola Marymount. She received her PhD in philosophy from the University of Freiburg in Switzerland, where she worked on a doctoral dissertation on the ethics and freedom in Blessed John Duns Scotus. She completed that and the very happy day was 19. 87, which she has never ever forgotten like nobody else has uh, when they've done that kind of hard work. So without further ado, I'm just honored to bring Sister Mary Beth Ingham, and I had the privilege to study with her in 2004 at St. Bonaventure University. Sister Mary Beth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a great honor for me to be invited to address you all on this important occasion of the symposium. I must confess at the outset that my knowledge of uh, Cardinal Newman is uh, quite limited. However, my familiarity with that other great Oxford master, John Duns Scotus, is happily a bit more extensive. My remarks this evening intend to flesh out some of the ways that the thought of this great Franciscan master, known as the Subtle Doctor, finds an echo in the 19th century vision of Cardinal Newman. Both men offer a rich resource for Catholics today and through them for the world. The resource, as I hope to explicate, involves a renewed discovery of the rationality of love and the centrality of Newman's own motto, cor ad cor loquitur. In his recent article published in America magazine, Refashioning Catholic Imagination, Robert Imbelli notes the significance of Newman's recentering of the Catholic imagination for a secular age. He identifies four learnings, learning to see the whole, learning to see Christ, learning holy living, and learning to praise. All of these learnings form, in Imbelli's opinion, a particular vision that is at the heart a refashioning of our current way of understanding ourselves, God, and our world. And all of these learnings point, I would hold, to the centrality of love and to rational love at the heart of a renewed Catholic vision so prized by Benedict, both in his homily last month in Birmingham and also in his recent encyclical Caritas in Veritate. For Newman's refashioning, reveals remarkable parallels with the thought of Scotus, as many of the sessions have shown. What I should like to do this evening is to trace out some of the elements that belong to Scotus' own refashioning for his own time. For over against a dominant Aristotelian and intellectualist model, he explored a refashioning of human rationality within the context of love, understood as the fullest perfection of the human person. In his own reframing of the dominant rational paradigm of his day, Scotus promotes the same type of refashioning that Benedict and Newman's visions advocate. With their focus on persons and human dignity, on the centrality of love, on the beauty of creation and the abundance of divine love, both Newman and Scotus might help to ground a renewed Oxford movement. I shall reflect first upon a core element of Scotus's thought, and indeed a core aspect of the Franciscan intellectual tradition, one that effectively reframes the medieval intellectual paradigm. Quite simply, this points to the rationality of love and freedom. The shift of rationality from the intellect our power of knowing, to the will, our power of choosing, which we discover in SCOTUS, results in what is quite simply, in my opinion, a sea change in our understanding of the human vocation, one that places SCOTUS at the center of a dialogue with Newman. This shift is so important that it requires our sustained reflection in order to reveal other important elements for the renewed Catholic imagination. These include the rediscovery of the via pulchritudinus, or the Franciscan path of beauty, and a life of respect and sustainability for the goods of the earth. Now, as we know, most contemporary studies of Scotus emphasize his affirmation of human freedom that results from his emphasis 
on the human will, our power of choosing. My argument maintains that it is Scotus's Franciscan identity that makes all the difference in his teaching on human freedom and the will. For it is not freedom that Scotus cares about, I think, but love. This means that for Scotus, the primacy of the will is really the primacy of charity, the primacy of ordered loving as central to human moral perfection, ordered loving as a particular way of knowing. So now we turn to the moral vision centered on love. Central to Franciscan spirituality as we know are two key elements. First, the order of love, the ordo amoris at the heart of the Franciscan vision, and second, a life of ongoing conversion, conversio. Both of these elements appear regularly in Francis of Assisi's admonitions, and they're part of the ongoing spiritual praxis of members of the Franciscan family. For the Franciscan intellectual and spiritual tradition, rationality can only make sense, first, in terms of the moral primacy of ordered loving, and second, in terms of the metaphysical possibility for conversion. And among the masters of the order, John Duns Scotus is the most famous proponent of such a Franciscan reframing of rationality <coughs> and the rational. As the recent encyclical Caritas in Veritate makes clear, the reframing of the rational and a reclaiming of the centrality of love for today cannot and should not take place independently of a spiritual tradition. In the Scotist reframing, we uncover three distinct elements and each one with a spiritual origin. First, rational freedom understood as the possibility of ongoing conversion. Second, moral judgment understood as an act of discernment. And third, the rehabilitation of beauty as an authentic moral concept. The foundations for all three of these involve a prior discussion of this reframed rationality centered on the rational will. And so it is to this reframed notion of rationality that I will first turn. Some of what I'm going to be saying evokes a number of insights that have been made both last night and today. So happily, I won't be introducing totally new topics for our consideration. As we know, Benedictine theologian Anselm of Canterbury, writing in the 12th century, had described rational beings in the following way. Each rational being is endowed with a twofold attraction to the good. The affection for happiness or possession, the commodi, and the affection for justice or rectitude, justitiae. These are the two metaphysical orientations, the two desires, as it were, of our rational heart. The affection for happiness or possession is a self-oriented but healthy love. It is not selfishness, but it is self-directed in its concerns. The affection belongs to rational beings as part of their natural constitution. It is a type of instinct for goodness or the beneficial and is drawn naturally to love something that each person perceives as good. Similar to a dog's love for the bone, the affection for happiness is directed toward objects that satisfy my natural desires, objects that look good to me. But the affection for justice, by contrast, is an affection for intrinsic goodness that considers the world of value insofar as it exists as valuable in itself and not necessarily valuable relative to the person who loves it or admires it. This affection, according to Anselm and Scotus, is the higher rational disposition that regulates and restrains natural inclinations toward possession and toward self-related good. A simple example will illustrate how these two affections might function. Let's say I have the opportunity to tell the truth to a friend. Now, I happen to fear that this revelation will seriously jeopardize our friendship. Indeed, it might destroy our friendship. From the perspective of the affection for happiness or possession, 
I might be inclined to lie to protect what I value in a self-centered type of way, or I might be inclined to say nothing. But from the perspective of the affection for justice, I realize that in this particular case, regardless of the consequences to me personally, the truth needs to be told. So the rational and free act accordingly would be to tell the truth, but perhaps to tell it as kindly as I possibly could, and live with whatever the consequences of this fact might be, and whatever implications it might have for the friendship. So we see in this example that taken together, and both for Scotus and Anselm, the two affections must be taken together. Each, uh, together they constitute a free and moral action. Neither one alone is capable of explaining moral choice. Indeed, alone, each one would function according to a model of stimulus response, as Anselm himself explains. And that goes for the affection for justice. The affection for justice could simply be a type of stimulus response for this higher good. So both Anselm and Scotus agree that without the two together, in tandem, working together, there would be nothing to distinguish human behavior from animal behavior. So far, so good. But now what Scotus will take up and significantly transform from Anselm will result in his own position on rational freedom and more importantly on the rationality of love. Let us consider this insight a bit more carefully. According to Scotus, human rationality expresses itself in a twofold manner. First, we are rational because we act with reason. Thanks to our innate affection for justice, we possess a higher and free disposition, inclined to follow the dictates of right reasoning, as well as the first principle of praxis, God is to be loved. This disposition is never necessitated, and this leads to the second manner that Scotus speaks that reveals our rational behavior. So not only are we rational because we act with reason, but we are more properly and more profoundly rational in terms of the internal constitution of these two affections and in terms of the way they interact in every choice. The affection for justice oversees and governs the affection for happiness in every moral action. Thanks to this ever-present interaction, rational beings possess a natural capacity for self-restraint, an innate metaphysical constitution for self-control. This capacity, however, must be developed over a lifetime and once perfected, expresses itself in the excellence of self-mastery. The artist, the dancer, the musician, all spend years developing the expertise proper to their art. Likewise, each human person has the vocation to such excellence. We are all called to develop the expertise that is proper to our human dignity. Now the interaction, just in case you thought that was easy enough, here's another distinction. The interaction between these two affections in it, the act of choice reveals in its turn three separate ways of relating to the goods of the world around me. In the presence of an object, I can choose to will it, the Latin term here is vele, to choose the object. I can choose to reject it, the Latin term here is nolle, or I can choose to abstain from making the choice, and the Latin here is non vele. Now non vele for Scotus is not the absence of a vele, it is rather a choice not to choose. This third act of the will, this non vele, is, in my opinion, the key to Scotus' understanding of our moral rationality, because it is an important self-reflexive act within the will, within the person. In the act of non vele, we discern how our capacity for perfected self-mastery is built into our own moral constitution at the metaphysical level, 
as part of our way of being in the world. We're going to return to this point about reflexive moral action a bit later on. When SCOTUS takes these two affections, the affection for justice and the affection for happiness or possession, and integrates them into his own Franciscan vision of human dignity, he expands upon Anselm's traditional teaching in a very important respect. With his, his Benedictine predecessor, Scotus affirms that both affections must be present for the act to be free. But Scotus adds, because of this requirement, both affections must belong to the will as an intrinsic and innate capacity to love the good. What's more, the affection for justice holds the key to our vocation for self-transcendence. It is because I'm able to make some choices in light of intrinsic goodness or in light of the well-being of another that I have a vocation to be more than myself. I am called to the highest love of all, love of friendship for the good alone. Now to understand the significance of this Scotist insight for a reframed understanding of our human vocation, we must recall that for Anselm, the affection for justice, this higher and rational affection, was lost as a result of the consequences of original sin and could only be restored by grace. Scotus argues, by contrast, that the affection for justice was not lost as a result of original sin. Rather, its ability to direct the affection for happiness has been weakened but not diminished. It, was, it is still present in the human will and it is still essential for human freedom. <coughs> now, why is this Franciscan shift? Why is this Franciscan reframing important for today? Well, first I think, of course, it points to the enormous optimism about the human person. An optimism repeated by Newman and equally importantly, in the pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world, Gaudium et Spes, as it considers the human person and the goodness of human desires in every age and in every culture. We see through Scotus's metaphysical analysis of willing how much confidence he, like Newman, has in human desires, how much confidence he has in the human capacity to love rationally. This capacity is our gift from God. We are constituted for the love of friendship, for self-transcendence in love. Scotus's Franciscan vision of love finds its source within the human heart, here understood as the center of all rational human inclinations. But we must remember, this source is constituted by the act of divine creativity and mirrors the ordered structure of the natural world around us. So our will is so, or our person is so constituted so as to fit in a type of connatural way with the reality as created by God. For Scotus, the first commandment, the first principle of praxis, love for God above all things, is both a primary and self-evident first principle, and more importantly, the first principle of praxis, a principle that is true both for divine and human rational choice. In this first principle of praxis, love for God above all, we discover the way in which human moral living both imitates divine life and more importantly, moves continually toward the integration of the two Anselmian affections, the affection for happiness and the affection for justice. For in God, love for the highest good is, in fact, love for the self. So Anselm's two affections, though distinct in us, are one in God. And as we move in throughout our lives to bring these two affections into closer and closer working relationship, we move closer and closer to mirroring the perfection that is in God. Love, to love God above all, captures the identity of these two affections in God, certainly, and in each human person virtually. 
For this reason, SCOTUS does not pit moral living against authentic human happiness, as if our natural perfection could dispose of our deepest satisfaction and delight. Nor does SCOTUS fall prey to a moral subjectivism based upon love as a personal experience of preference. Now this reframing of rationality that we find in SCOTUS grounds, as I've said, quite literally a paradigm shift. It moves from knowing to loving as center point of human rational dignity. And we might say it moves from knowing to ordered loving as center point of human rational dignity. And like any good paradigm shift, it will now introduce a reorganization of all of the elements within the vision. Said differently, the Franciscan vision is grounded on our intrinsic constitution toward right and ordered loving and freedom as evidence of rational being. We are innately gifted with everything we need to love God above all things in concrete circumstances of our lives. And even the consequences of original sin have not deprived us of our capacity to love rightly. Here we perceive the basis for the important Christological reframing that is also part of Scotus's Franciscan vision. What's more, this internal constitution we possess as a gift offers us, in addition, an internal goal, and that is the inner harmony of our affective and rational desires. For in every action, my goal resembles that of a juggler or a tightrope walker that is balanced and harmonic integration. Here is the key to peace of mind and heart, and here I think we see Franciscan optimism and Christian humanism at their very best. So now, an ethics of beauty and moral artistry. If we have understood this central insight, this reframing of rationality of love, then I think we can see more clearly the first implications from Scotus's vision. That is the primacy of moral beauty and moral artistry. For following Augustine, Scotus describes the moral act as a beautiful whole which, within which all elements are in harmony with one another. In the morally good act, we recognize the integration of proportion and harmony. Although he uses beauty as a moral category, it is important to note that Scotus does not defend a subjective theory of human preference. Classical theories of beauty, as we know, whether Platonic, Neoplatonic, or Stoic, were highly structured in their affirmation of the objectivity of the beautiful. Musical harmony, itself grounded on mathematics and mathematical relationships, offered a rich exemplar for the sort of scientific recognition of beauty that medieval thinkers accepted and prized. For Scotus, the experience of harmony in music expresses the highest form of human rational judgment, and he uses an analogy of hearing dissonance in music in the De Primo Principio, where he talks about the possibility of this term ens infinitum, infinite being, as a proper name for God. Now, how is this possible? How is the will, even the rational will, able to recognize beauty? Well, in Ordinatio 2, Distinction 6, the very text where Scotus takes and reframes Anselm's two affections, Scotus calls the will a vis collativa, a power that, like the intellect, is able to assemble pieces of information, placing them alongside one another. The will, like the intellect, can bring items together and perceive their relationship. Scotus actually, in this text, attributes a type of moral judgment based on, based on a moral resonance to the will. And this ability to recognize a quality is likened to musical, our musical ability to hear harmonic tones. And I only need to recall the liturgy, where we had the beautiful harmonic uh, music. There are important, as we know, there are important classical, 
patristic, and stoic antecedents to this type of reflection. This insight that links moral goodness directly to beauty and illustrates moral judgment in terms of a recognition of harmony. Indeed, the Stoic identification, just to single out Stoic reflection, the Stoic identification in Roman Stoicism, the Stoic identification of moral goodness with beauty reveals an intrinsic connection between ethics and the rational recognition of to kalon, the beautiful or the good, translated into Latin by the medievals as honestum. And Alexander of Hales, one of the earliest masters of the Franciscan tradition, identified the honestum as intelligible beauty. But to return to Roman Stoicism, in Cicero's De Officiis, for example, moral rectitude is presented by Cicero as a species of beauty. And he notes that just as beauty is inseparable from health, so too decorum, which is fittingness, aptness, beauty, or propriety, these are all terms to uh, translate decorum, uh, Cicero states, is inseparable from rectitude. Later in the De Officiis, Cicero develops the analogy of moral hearing and harmonic attention as a type of consciousness examen, that we listen to parts of our day to see what was out of tune, because sometimes, Cicero states, major moral development can spring from a minor awareness of a small note out of tune. And Cicero was very well known uh, in the uh, in, in Oxford and, and in Paris for the medievals. This, this would not be a text they were unfamiliar with. Such moral recognition in the will might be likened to spiritual discernment, where the morally mature person possesses a well-trained moral sense, a moral ear capable of picking up dissonance in a given situation. The moral agent, like a well-trained musician, or indeed, like a piano tuner, can immediately detect harmony or dissonance within a situation. You know, we often think of the moral expert as an umpire or a judge. And I think if we really reflect more on this type of model, we begin to find other richer analogies for us as we think about the moral expert. The piano tuner, I think, is, a, is an ideal analogy because it's a person who has to have perfect pitch in order to be able to tune a, an instrument. Here we might find something similar to Newman, what Newman is getting at in the illative sense. Here we're in the presence of the convergence of evidence leading to an immediate act of assent, Scotus says. In fact, Scotus makes the point that the, the trained or well-formed moral expert knows immediately what to do, whereas the um, moral learner or the person who's the neophyte in moral matters has to reason slowly and inferentially through a syllogistic process in order to come to the conclusion about what they are to do. Here we find that key and energetic act of real assent with the concrete certainty. This is the practical expertness that exemplifies an act of judgment rather than a rule-based inferential reasoning process. Such a model for practical and moral judgment enables us to look upon the human person as a moral performing artist. We're able to assess the moral situation from the perspective of its potential for rational beauty and to regard moral training as an apprenticeship in beauty with rehearsal and practice as part of the development of character. Indeed, this more aestheticized frame leads us to regard mistakes and errors as part of the life of ongoing conversion and development. No one would ever try to learn to play a musical instrument with the assumption, the naive assumption, that they would never make a mistake. In this reframed model, we recognize the seeds for a program of moral pedagogy that identifies goodness with beauty and lends foundation to the universal call to holiness, an important theme of Vatican II, as well as an important aspect of Newman's sermons. Moral education might now be reimagined to involve the development of a taste for the beautiful, 
not a mere attraction to the agreeable, but rather a deep appreciation of beauty as a total environment in nature, in persons, in acts of generosity and kindness. SCOTUS offers us here a fruitful and dynamic way to consider the human person as a moral performing artist, the moral situation in its potential for rational beauty as a work of art, where things are not always as perfect as we might like them. Moral living as apprenticeship in beauty. Far from a moral fundamentalism or a rule-based legalism, SCOTUS's emphasis on the convergence of moral precepts, the first principle of praxis and its relationship to moral science, the commands of the Decalogue, for example, and concrete evidence of a moral situation, reflects his commitment to the primacy of individual conscience and its judgments, another point of contact with Newman. So just uh, briefly, and to kind of perhaps make this point a little bit more clearly, for Scotus, there are three dimensions that are present in a moral judgment. The first principle of praxis, which is love for God above all. The principles of moral science, which are both derived from this person, this first principle and contained in the commandments of the Ten Commandments, the other Nine Commandments, the Seven Commandments that relate to the neighbor, but also from learned moral experiences. So there are kind of d double sources for moral science. It can be my own experiences over a lifetime, but also the commandments of the Ten Commandments that can be seen in harmony with the first principle of praxis to love God above all things. And then in the presence of a concrete situation for moral uh, judgment. Similar to um, the music that a musician has to play from, moral science functions as uh, an absolutely necessary prerequisite for any moral decision, but never quite exhausts what might happen in an actual moral performance, where the moral agent also brings the creativity of any musical performer to the execution of the action. And all of these, Scotus says, are important parts of the moral situation. Who I am, what I'm doing, how I'm doing it, when I'm doing it, all of these things in the act of execution become critical in moral assessment. So we're moving toward the close. And we come to the final, the second point, the final point, the, an ethics of right loving and right use. This vision of rational love and this focus on moral artistry that we find in Scotus thought suggests a second and perhaps surprising benefit to be gained from this reframed notion of rationality. An expanded notion of the rational points beyond the practical dimension of right loving to the deeper dimension of right use as the true moral goal for a renewed way of thinking, which both Newman and Scotus promote. Ordered or right loving is central to the Augustinian legacy of the Franciscan moral tradition. This perfection of rational loving is possible, thanks once again to the dynamic interaction of Anselm's two affections as human freedom reaches out to a world of beauty and goodness. But right loving doesn't merely mean loving the right things. Rather, it means loving the right thing in the right way, loving persons as they deserve, loving everything that exists as it deserves. Scotus's position on moral freedom as self-mastery, again, grounded on the dynamic and rational interaction of the two affections within the will, can now be seen in light of another Franciscan value the value of poverty, understood here not as a deprivation, but as usus pauper, the restrained use of goods and possessions. Here certainly we find an aspect of critical importance for today's global and economic realities. For a moral perspective that is able to link rational freedom con and conversion to a notion of restrained use can easily frame discussions on global distributive justice, on the environment, and on human stewardship, not as consequences or applications or even as extensions of a moral vision, but rather as the indispensable 
presuppositions of the highest human moral perfection. On this point, I think, Scotus's Franciscan vision offers the most resonance with the call of Benedict's recent encyclical Caritas in Veritate. So the point I'm trying to make here, if we, if we really understand freedom for Scotus, in terms of the interaction of these two affections within the will, what we discover is not only the basis of right and ordered loving, we understand the metaphysical possibility for conversion because the will is capable of self-restraint, and we understand the notion of uh, the restrained use of the goods of the earth as all part of the manifestation of the perfectibility of the human will. Things just get better and better. Right? The human and rational capacity for reflexive self-restraint, and that's really the interaction of these two affections, reflexive self-restraint, and therefore for the restrained use of the goods of the earth, support and grounds not just an ethics of love and beauty, but an ethics of environmental stewardship. The natural order in all of its beautiful manifestations is not only the gift of divine creative love, but it's the domain for our protection and care. Scotus's Franciscan refashioning now comes more clearly into view. A moral vision of love based on human rational metaphysical affections, a moral pedagogy of ongoing conversion, an image of moral artistry based on the will's power to note the convergence of elements in order to detect harmony that is present. This is this type of possible model for spiritual discernment. Here's a vision of moral discernment where the moral ear is continually attuned and called to be increasingly attuned, a morality of right loving, of self-restraint and responsible use. Here's the Franciscan vision in its most contemporary relevance for our world today. And here, I think, is what we also perceive in the thought of John Henry Cardinal Newman. In SCOTUS, we discover a Franciscan vision of artistry, this via pulchritudinous, this path of beauty, whose moral journey of development involves a pedagogy of beauty. We develop an awareness of the beauty of the world and a consciousness of our own ability to bring forth beauty in concrete terms, wherever things are not always as we would like them to be. The challenge for such a moral artist or moral artisan is to widen the moral frame beyond a narrowly circumscribed moral dilemma so popular in textbooks and moral discussions today. For the task of the Franciscan moral artisan is to consider all aspects and all relationships that combine to enhance moral beauty, all under the direction of the primary principle of praxis, God is to be loved. Here at last, I think, we discover an ethics for this third millennium, an ethics of beauty, self-mastery, and restrained use. The two revised Anselmian affections provide Scotus with a point of departure for a reimagined vision of human perfection and fulfillment. His is a vision based on rational love as the fullest perfection of the person. And in their on-the-spot rational interaction, these two affections open the door for an experience of conversion, the decisive moment where a person can stop one type of activity and turn toward another. And this moment of readiness might also be understood in SCOTUS as a type of spiritual indifference. For at this moment, the moral decision involves the deepest attention to spiritual listening, the core ad core loquitur, where heart speaks most truly to heart and the agent stops and waits to hear what God might be saying for this particular situation. Such a vision in Scotus as well as Newman distills, I think, the hope and the optimism at the core of the Christian vision, along with its insistence on right and selfless loving as the fullest expression of human dignity, human happiness, and human perfection both in the order of moral living 
and the order of divine communion, the way of beauty offers the bridge, the bridge of continuity between human life and divine life, a continuity so prized by the Franciscan tradition. True moral living takes its place as part of a lifelong journey of spiritual artistic development, a pilgrimage toward beauty in the world and in the human heart. Moral instruction, then, can be reimagined as a paideia, whose purpose is the formation of artisans capable of bringing forth beauty in the contingent order, expressing their freedom and creativity in imitation of God. The artistic paideia could indeed be the basis for conceiving the, moral, the domain of moral living neither as a realm of unyielding absolute legal principles, on the one hand, nor as a field of fluid personal preference on the other. Moral living could once again be understood in the broad and inclusive spiritual frame of ongoing conversion, the dynamic context that promotes the integration of what is best in rational human loving and rational spiritual aspirations. And this reframing, this reimagining, could open up a space for intercultural and interreligious dialogue on the deepest values of human life and future. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Mary Beth. And uh, we open the floor now to questions or comments. Uh, take a few moments to collect our thoughts. <laughs> Our um, I just wanted to get at your idea of beauty. Um, um, it seems like you mentioned imitation at the end, and um, my, my understanding of beauty is that it always involves some level of of imitation. That 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 that. In some way, the beautiful for Plato and Aristotle, at least, um, was something that was something that would motivate a person, right? So they imitate Achilles, right? So it's uh, the beautiful played a moral role um, in the ancient world as as training people's consciences to to imitate somebody. So um, I wonder how that is that what you mean by uh, the the via the the, the way of the, the beautiful? Via yeah, yeah, that it's an imitation. It's less of a focus on just uh, do this, don't do that, um, on kind of abstract rules, but it's kind of a concrete imitation of something that is apprehended not only in the mind but also in the affect. Well, it certainly, it certainly involves some type of apprehension, but uh, we need to recall also that um, beauty is one of the transcendentals, so that it's the union of the true and the good, right? And... Um, in Dionysius is on the divine names, which is a very important text for certainly for the Franciscan tradition, but also for medieval thinkers. Beauty is a a, a very close second name for God, yeah. of which good was the first name, and immediately following that was the name of beauty. So, to the extent that there is a dimension of imitation, yes. To the extent that it is merely imitating human examples, no. So. so well, certainly, or divine goodness, uh -huh. yes. I think the notion of spiritual imitation mm -hmm. of these highest examples of uh -huh. uh, divine goodness, divine abundance, could be mm -hmm. called to mind. And that's ongoing conversion. I think so. Yeah. That's right. I, I mean, I, I think it's a notion of a path to be walked. Mm -hmm. So when I talk about the via pulchritudinis, I, I wasn't exactly thinking of it merely as an imitation. I was thinking of it more as a pilgrimage moving closer and closer toward the fullest understanding mm -hmm. of beauty and the fullest expression of beauty in our own lives. Mm -hmm. um, a path that involves integrating in the way that beauty is the integration of the okay, true and yeah, the good, yeah, so yeah. it's a personal internal yeah. integration yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. But we certainly learn it 
and, and we need mentors. Mm -hmm. And so to, to see it as a formative journey, mm -hmm. I think, is also a very fruitful way of looking at it. Sister Jane? Sister, I'm sorry, I missed if um, the analogy to music was your own or if, it's that, or, or if that's actually in SCOTUS. It's in SCOTUS. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, it's in the uh, De Primo Principio, it, yeah, it's in the De Primo Principio where he talks about, on the treatise on God as First Principle, where he talks about the purest concept of God that philosoph of which philosophy is capable, and that's infinite being, ends infinitum. And then SCOTUS begins to talk about this um, concept and asks the question, is it possible for the mind to, or how, how is this, um, if this concept, these two terms, being an infinite, involve a contradiction, or if they can be understood to be logically possible. And the example he gives is, just as the ear is so attentive and so sensitive to tonal discord, if these two terms were in, uh, if they were logically contradictory, and if we could not attribute infinity, modal infinity, to the notion of being, we would perceive that immediately. So that's the only uh, concrete analogy that he gives. There are many other examples of um, aesthetic images that he gives. That's the only musical one okay. that I think... No, uh, that's marvelous because that's exactly what Hopkins does. He has this notion of... Because he himself loved music. Mm -hmm. And he speaks about pitch of being, but he oh. also talks about pitch, that, that God wants to pitch us, pitch as a verb. He wants to pitch us to that pitch of being so that we'll be in part of the musical symphony. But he uses both the, 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 the fact that our lives are like a symphony mm -hmm. in, through our choices, and he uses specifically moral choices for mm -hmm. that. And then also to reach our part in the musical symphony. Mm -hmm. And he even speaks about the devil as the, as the one who introduces dissonance, mm -hmm. the thrower of things off track. So mm -hmm. thank you very mm -hmm. much, sister. Yes. Um, so th there's also a text where Scotus comments, somewhat autobiographically, that he always <coughs> wanted to learn to play a musical instrument, but that his fingers weren't um, agile enough for him to be able to do that. So I don't know if it's a... Um, he's a frustrated musician, and so it's, it's, it's entering into his own consideration of these cases, but thank you. No, Christopher Devlin is, his book on SCOTUS or does quite a reflection on that pitch idea. Oh, good. Any I further? Pat has. Pat. Yes. Pat. Thanks, Mary Beth. I've heard um, Sister Mary Beth speak before. We were, had the privilege of having um, Mary Beth as our visiting scholar last fall at our university. And you were also, as you recall, a consultant on our formation of our doctoral program yes. in educational leadership where we wanted to, or the dean at the time, wanted uh, the Franciscan perspective to be the, the distinguishing characteristic, quote, whatever that meant. So uh, we actually sat down and tried to fashion a program. And the ethics course, which is the foundation of the program and the first course the students take uh, tries to integrate some of these ideas and as much as I've heard you say this when you said something very small tonight um, I, I recalled something very differently um, what you said was almost in passing um, this vision is very different than ethical um, programs where it's a matter of um, do the right thing, avoid the wrong thing, or examining case studies, things like that. Right. In, in the program that we fashioned, uh, we have a component that is a very reflective component, and fortunately there's a professor at Boston College who has written a lot, and he's a former Jesuit, but he sounds very much like SCOTUS, so we use that text. And then there are case studies, but um, inevitably the feedback from the students is that for the first time in their professional lives, and most of the students are either principals or assistant superintendents or persons aspiring to be um, in some of these positions, 
they've been given the freedom to reflect upon their own decision-making process and that image of the musician, the artist, and you also use the image of wind chime, trying to balance everything, has given them the freedom, in a sense, to make mistakes and learn from them and know that that's a growth process and to get away from only thinking in terms of um, I have to know all the legally correct things to do that the ethical leader, ethical leadership is much deeper than knowing the rules. And it's uh, the feedback of our doctoral cohort. I wish I could have recorded it for you. Uh, We were working with the cohort that's beginning their dissertation is that for many of them, and it has reframed the way they act as leaders. And in all of our cohorts, we only have three individuals who are in Catholic systems. So they've been able to carry this out in a public um, arena very well. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I mean, it's clear, I think, that, that this is a, it's a very different way of looking at moral life. It's a very different way of looking at um, it's, it's heavily imbued with spirituality, and it always has to be tied to a spiritual tradition. Otherwise, it just kind of implodes in on itself. However, I think for today, if you're familiar at all with a lot of uh, some, some of what is going on in the area now kind of called postmodernity, the return to beauty is uh, a very, very popular topic and uh, a number of writers and philosophers are exploring it again, particularly in Augustine and, and the centrality of beauty for someone like Augustine, who, again, is kind of regaining uh, interest in terms of uh, a lot of the postmodern scholars. And so I think uh, from that perspective, the conversation is going to begin to be open relative to notions of beauty and how notions of beauty can function fruitfully within human rational behavior and particularly with moral living. The, the, the problem or the difficulty or the challenge, right, we all love a challenge, is the way in which beauty today is understood by almost all, if not all, of our colleagues as a matter of personal preference. And so the difficulty is to overcome uh, a, a rather naive subjectivism about beauty, but I think it's a remarkable moment in a conversation that is happening around us, and a particularly remarkable moment for the members of the Franciscan family, because I really do think beauty is at the heart of Francis's uh, experience of God, certainly Claire's experience of God, the Franciscan thinker's experience of God. It is definitely a terrain upon which the Franciscan spiritual tradition is built. And um, at this point, I think the Franciscan tradition is probably the best equipped to enter the dialogue and begin to reflect on it. I think in maybe the last 15 years or so, a number of studies have come out um, on Thomas Aquinas and the role of beauty in Thomas Aquinas. And Thomas does speak about beauty. Uh, You have to go after it and, and find it. Uh, I think beauty is more natural to the Franciscan expression of its own spiritual tradition. But clearly, it's, I think in the next 10 years or so, we're going to be seeing more and more conversations about beauty, particularly linking it to moral behavior and moral action. And I think there's where we need to be very careful that it doesn't just become, you know, um, <coughs> there's no discussion of matters of taste, right? It's, I think it's good, therefore I, can, therefore I can do it. And so there I want to emphasize the importance of the objective understanding of beauty that was present in classical and uh, certainly in medieval spiritual context. And mathematics was a science that was used, a science of mathematical proportions. And so that's where when you have musical, um, when the musical analogy is used as a judgment for beauty, we must not forget the importance of mathematical relationships as the precision of the judgment of beauty. It was not uh, mere preference. It was rather the piano tuner. It was the perfect pitch, the notion of someone with perfect pitch that would be the model for the moral decision maker. Yes, Father. This would be the last question. Thank you. 
Sister Mary Beth, I'm, I'm gobsmacked. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to ask you if you could move just for a moment with this notion of beauty from the philosophical to the theological realm with Scotus in particular, the tota pulcra es Maria, the notion of the Scotus and the Immaculate Conception. And uh, there seems to be a, a direct correlation between, in the Franciscan tradition, between uh, the way of beauty uh, in the metaphysical sense that you've been describing it aesthetically and the way of beauty in the theological sense with respect to the Immaculate Conception. Am I off base? No, no, that? I don't think so. I mean, that's the potuit decuit fecit, right? That's yeah. the uh, God yeah. could do it. it. It is fitting for God to do it. We could say it is beautiful. Uh, therefore, why not, right? And I would always say I will err on the side of generosity. I would rather be wrong attributing more beauty and more graciousness to God's actions and to um, creatures, Mary as well as anyone else, than, uh, than err on the side of deficiency and um, by attributing less beauty and less goodness to someone. So I think to always err on the side of more generosity is uh, perhaps one could say uh, one of Scotus's methodological principles that we know we're going to be wrong because we're probably not going to get it right. So let's go ahead and be generous and what does he say? As long as scripture and, and um, rational reflection doesn't argue against it, let's attribute as much as we possibly can. And so I think that is a kind of maximizing beauty. He also says of the incarnation that it is God's summum opus, right? So God's greatest work of art is the act of the incarnation. So I think, I think there's a lot of aesthetic overtones in much of what Scotus does. And I, personally, I've just attributed that to the aesthetic dimension of Franciscan thought and to the Franciscan spiritual tradition. Okay, thank you. We thank you, Sister Mary Beth, for coming all the way from Los Angeles to give us this lecture this evening. And I'd like to summarize it in a phrase that our Holy Father uses when he says, and this is our closing prayer, Mother of beautiful love, pray for us. Good night.